Faith, the law of change. Faith, the law of change. Let's look at our uh, uh, foundation scripture. We're going to look at a couple of them, the ones we've been looking at. Romans 3.27, we'll start there, Romans 3.27. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. If we look at verse 30, seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. Notice, circumcision did not save Abraham. Abraham was circumcised after he believed God, not before. And we have a circumcision of the heart that we receive after we believe. So circumcision did not avail anything. They did not become children of God through circumcision. They became his covenant partners. So the law of faith, in the law of faith, because it's a law, there are laws that govern the law of faith, and we saw that the law of faith, the parts are eyes, ears, and mouth. It gets in our heart, and when it's in our heart, we speak. Faith always speaks. Faith hears. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And hearing, it's a continual thing, and faith comes. God does not respond to what we do. God responds to what he has already done for us. And that's important because if he responded to what we did, we probably wouldn't be here today. We'd be done. We'd have been done a long time ago. So praise God, he doesn't respond to what we do, and yet in our arrogance, we sometimes think that we can work and get whatever God has blessed, promised us, but it's by faith. It's not by works. It's not by us doing something. Um, You know, we talked about, uh, it was mentioned, seeking the kingdom of God. Now, seeking the kingdom of God is, of course, sowing financially into the kingdom so the kingdom of God can spread, so the gospel can go throughout. But when you volunteer and you're involved in the church and you're ushering or or doing whatever, you're ministering, that's seeking the kingdom of God because it's allowing the church, the body of Christ, to be ministered to and for it to flow. If there were no people seeking the kingdom of God with their volunteering, we wouldn't be able to function. So when you look at it as volunteering, look at it instead of saying, I'm volunteering, where you could just say, I'm seeking the kingdom of God. Too often we think of seeking the kingdom of God as finances merely, and of course it is. But Jesus said, when you seek the kingdom of God, nothing will be lacking. All those other things will be added to you. So see yourself when you're working or volunteering. You're not doing it to get saved. You're not doing it for any purpose but to please your heavenly father because you're seeking his kingdom so his kingdom can grow on the earth. And so that's time you put in so that's something you can believe God for. Does that make sense? Sometimes we're so focused on finances, and of course we're to sow our finances, but sowing our finances shows we trust God. Amen? And so we're seeking the kingdom of God, we're sowing seeds, why? So the gospel can go. Why are you volunteering? So the gospel can go. Amen? Those are, we don't look at it, well I'm volunteering, and I've put in 12 hours 13 hours, 25 hours this month. God, you owe me 25 hours. Well, see, now you're trying to work. You're trying to work and say, God, I've done this for you. Now you better pay me it back. Well, he's already got done everything for us. He's given us Jesus. Amen? So volunteering is not a work, but it's working the kingdom. You're not working to get blessed. Everybody, you don't have to say this, I'm going to say this. If you want to say it afterwards, you can. 
I am not working to get blessed. I already am blessed, and therefore I work. I'm already blessed, and because I'm blessed, I do that. You see, it's different, because if we're thinking I'm working to get blessed, Satan will come in and tell you, you've never done enough. And that's where the law of faith comes in. Let's continue this. I said God responds to what he has done. God responds to us on behalf of what Jesus has done for us already. I don't have to work to get healed. I am the healed. And Satan has come to steal it from me. But God's provided it for me. I don't have to work to get healed. Glory to God. Hallelujah. He says, speak my word and you'll have whatever you say. So I just speak his word knowing that I'll have whatever I say. Amen. So then let's go to, um, let's go where? Romans uh, 3.20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For the no law is the knowledge of sin. Well, if somebody comes up against you... <clears throat> And he starts saying, look, how many hours have you volunteered? How much money have you given? You should be. And then you list off all these things that people say you should be doing. Now you're under the law. That's being under the law. You know in your heart what you should do to seek first the kingdom of God. There isn't a law. There was a law when you came in the door, we'd have you sign a form dedicating your life to doing X amount of time, X amount of work, doing X, all this stuff. And then we'd hold up your contract and say, well, if you don't do this, that's been done away with. I trust God. And when you trust God, you know that if you give and to seek the kingdom, all these things will be added unto you. So anyway, verse 21, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. 22, even the righteousness of God, leave out that which is, but even the righteousness of God by faith of Jesus. Now, uh, I looked that up because that just so caught my attention. By faith of Jesus. And a lot of the translations say faith in Jesus. And of course, we need faith in Jesus. And Jesus is the word, so you have faith in the word. But the righteousnesses of God by faith of Jesus. I looked up the um, Young's literal translation, and it says the same thing. By faith of Jesus. Now, that's different than... Faith in Jesus. So the righteousness is of God by faith of Jesus. Jesus went to the cross by faith. He spoke he would be raised. He knew he was the prince of righteousness. His faith was, uh, in, when you read the Gospels, he said he would come back the third day. He would be raised. His faith was was released so that we would be made the righteousness of God in Christ. He became sin so we could be made righteous. So it's by Jesus' faith that we're made righteous. And that's a big difference. Because it's Jesus' faith that made us righteous. Yes, it's our faith when we believe, but that faith came from the word, and who's the word? Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word. Jesus and the word are one, so faith comes by Jesus, by Jesus, by Jesus. Another scripture, New Testament scripture, we don't have to go there, but it says in Hebrews, Jesus is the author and finisher of, of our faith. So whose faith do we have? If he, if somebody authored it, whose is it? 
the person that authored it. Because we're getting it, and that's a law of faith. Because too often we look at our faith, and I know Jesus said, your faith made you whole, but her faith came by knowing she was the daughter of Abraham. Her faith came by the covenant. She didn't just dream it up. It came from the word. When we see this, we're, we're removing our own ability from it. The faith of Jesus. We all have Jesus' faith. He's the author of our faith. Now Jesus said, the works that I do shall you do also, and greater works than these shall you do because I go to my Father. And the Holy Spirit's going to come and he's going to be your helper, and you're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit the same as I was filled with the Holy Spirit, so now you're going to be able to do the works that I do. And we go, well, no, I haven't got enough faith. Excuse me. Jesus said for you to do it, and when you realize the faith you have is Jesus' faith, and he did it, and he told you to do it, now you can do it because you're operating in his faith. And then you say, well, faith comes by hearing, and hearing the word of God. Of course, this Bible is faith seed. This is a law. I take the word of God in. My eyes, my ears, my mouth. I take it in, I speak it, I hear it. Now Jesus' faith gets in my heart by the Holy Spirit. And we can say it's our faith, but that's how faith comes. Faith comes in that by continually hearing it, seeing it, speaking it, it gets in your heart. If it isn't in your heart, there's no power released when you speak. And so we're looking too much at ourselves sometimes, what I've done and how much I've gotten. The kingdom of God operated in Donna's life because she believed it. It operates in all of our life. I'll tell you, do you want to know where the kingdom of God is? It's in your, Jesus said, now it's near you and it's in you. The kingdom of God is within every believer. It's in there. We're talking about faith, the law that changes things. This will change the way we look at things, the way we operate. And in Ephesians, we saw, we are not going to go there. Ephesians 2, you can put it up, Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Now, when you go to the first part of that, Ephesians 2.6 is hooked on, really, it's all in a bracket. It says, when Jesus was raised, God saw us raised. We've been raised with Christ, seated in heavenly places. Then it goes on, we didn't have a covenant. After verse 10, we didn't have a covenant. We were estranged from the commonwealth. To God, we were not even a people. We had nothing. We had nothing we could call on. We were not the physical seed of Abraham. We had nothing. Zero. And we don't like to think that. We like to think, well, we had something going for us. Well, you did. You had nothing going for you, and you had the love of God for you. So that's the state we were in. So it's as we were without God. We didn't even know to call on God until we heard the gospel, until we heard the good news. And once we heard the good news, Romans chapter 10, it says in it, we heard the good news, and then we believed in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. And we heard the good news about how Jesus shed his blood for us and how he died so that we might be made righteous, so I don't have to try and get rid of all this sin in my life and make myself good enough. He sent Jesus, 
who became sin. So I might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. And all I did was hear the gospel, hear the good news, believe in my heart. I didn't believe in my heart by myself. The Holy Spirit gave me that revelation that Jesus truly did rise from the dead and that he is Lord. So I believed and I confessed the law of faith in action. It created a change. I became the righteousness of God right at that moment. When we realize that it's God that did this, it gets us into freedom. Because now we're looking at God to affect the change, not us to affect the change. And too often we're looking at what we can do to get a change, but it's what God's already done in Jesus that will affect the change. Sometimes we think people have to clean up before they can become a child of God. I've heard that. You, if you can get yourself cleaned up before you believe Jesus, then you don't need him. Isn't that right now? Why would he come? If you can become good enough without him, he wouldn't have needed to come. It would have been a waste. I mean, that would have been just, just ignorance gone to seed. But yet after we're born again, we somehow think we can do something to get something. What we do is go to the Word and operate in the law of faith. Paul said, I believe, therefore I speak. You believe, therefore you speak. So the faith, it's the faith that connects you to the unlimited power of God. And we're going to maybe get to that. Well, hopefully we'll see that. So then we saw that um, the uh, amount of faith you operate in is directly proportional to the revelation knowledge that you have of God through the word. And we saw in 2 Peter, it's through the knowledge that you increase. My people, not the world's people, my people, God's people, Children of God perish for a lack of knowledge. And Peter said all these great and exceeding promises. Second Peter chapter 1. These exceeding great and precious promises are yours through the knowledge of God. Through the knowledge of God. And so by faith you read the word, you speak the word, you pray and ask the Holy Spirit for revelation knowledge and he will give it to you, and you will then understand. We've seen that we're identified with Christ, that um, we're the blueprint of God's likeness displayed in human form. Every feature of his image is mirrored in us. Every feature of Jesus is mirrored in us, because why? We're in him, and we're joint heirs with him. And we looked at last week, we talked about the printed material and a copy, and if you have a TV picture and it gets fuzzy, the reception's not right. Something's trying to cut in. And if you start speaking the words of the devil, if you're looking at the wrong thing, if you think, well, I can just dabble in this a little bit, well, I can just do that and stay pure and clean. You're wrong because you're putting in the wrong dots and you're destroying the image of righteousness and holiness in you. I'm not saying you no longer are righteous, but you have now destroyed it. Anything that you try and hide will eventually be brought to the light. I was listening to Keith Moore and he was talking and he talked about forgiving and, and various other things and judging and and but he said this is the part i want us to hear he says satan will come and he is trying to get you to take something of his and he gave many examples but you see sometimes we think i've done this and if i do it we've sort of got this idea that god's going to smack us upside the head the minute we do something wrong well, now we're past that idea, so we think that if God's not going to do it immediately, if I do it wrong, I've, Satan's going to come and immediately do something to me. 
No, he's been at this a long time. And like Keith Moore said, he doesn't care if he has to wait five years. He doesn't care if he has to wait 10 years. He will wait for an opportune time. And the scripture for that is when Jesus was tempted, he didn't fall for it. It said Satan left him for an opportune time. And so if you open the door, he will come at an opportune time when he can come in. So if there's any area, it says that the word is light. If there's any area that the light of the word is blocked out in your life, you better get the light of the word in it because Satan is waiting for an opportune time. And there are so many believers that all of a sudden you think, Christian, why did this happen to them? Because the seeds were there, the image was rearranged, and it's like, well, I don't think it's that bad. If it's not that bad, will you stand up here and proclaim it, exactly what you're doing? The law of faith works. And you can have, we call it fear, but fear is really faith in the enemy's ability to harm you. So you're, it's just fear is faith in the devil. It's just a reversal. And there's laws that go with it, and it will happen. So we looked at that, how the dots can be rearranged. We saw that Joshua was told you can have what you see. Abraham was said what you can see. Abraham said, seeing I go childless, God had already said, I've given it to your seed. So let's just look at John chapter 1. John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Now we're talking about the word. And Jesus, let's keep going, is the word. All things were made by him. By who? By the word. And who's the word? Jesus. If it's not Jesus' word, if it doesn't line up to the light, it's darkness. Darkness cannot overtake light. But light can overtake darkness or darkness will be pushed away because of the light. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. And we'll later look hopefully at Hebrews where we will see that again. And the light shines in the darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. The darkness could not stand it. Now, the light it's talking about is the glory. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, and God said, Light be, he's not talking about the sun, moon, and stars. That was created later. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness about the light. Notice, the word... Light. Jesus is the word light. If there's an area in your life that's darkness, the light will cast that out. Doesn't matter what it is. If it's poverty, light will cast it out. If it's sickness, light will cast it out. Deliverance for your mind to think right. The light will change that were to renew our mind, change the way we think. But the only way we will have change permanently is through the word of God, by bringing in that light. The minute you look at, think about darkness or something that doesn't line up with the light, you are now bringing that darkness in. Which is why God said, resist the devil and he will flee. 
That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him. So we know that the word, in the beginning was the word, created the world. Here again it's saying the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Twelve, but as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them which believe on his name. That's back to Ephesians. By grace, through faith. And, and the reason I'm going over and over this, I want us to so see how it's Jesus and the Word. And when Jesus spoke, he was there at the beginning of the world, and all things were made through him. And he has not lost his power. So the Word has not lost its power. And what it did in the beginning, it will do today. And it's not dependent on us. The only thing that's dependent on us is to get the word, pray in the Holy Ghost, and get it in our spirit, man, and speak it. But we cannot give ourselves revelation knowledge. And you can have it all in your head and think we know everything and we speak and nothing happens. We can memorize the whole Bible and we can speak scriptures. But if we never got it in our heart and got revelation knowledge, there's no power because it's the heart. When you believe in your heart and then you speak, things change. Faith is of the heart, not the head. Verse 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. Grace and truth came by Jesus. If you don't want truth on something, you're saying, in an area you might be saying, well, you know, I just don't believe in that healing stuff or I don't believe in that sickness, in that tongues, or I don't believe in this, or I think this is okay, or I think it's okay to do this. If it doesn't line up with the word of God, you are rejecting truth. Then you are rejecting what Jesus did for you in that area. You can't separate things. We want to separate things and say, well, I believe in Jesus and that, that, but this is. No. Truth and Jesus are together. And grace and Jesus are together. But you access the grace by getting the truth, and it's all Jesus. Hallelujah. So words created everything, and words will rearrange everything, positive or negative. Words created everything, and words will rearrange everything. So anything in your life that needs rearranging, get the word of God. Not your word, the God's word. Our words and God's word should be the same thing. And you think, well, people will think I'm strange. They probably do already. <laughs> do you know, you can go out there and look at your car and tell people, you know, this is the best car, it's a real good car, and it can look like an old clunker, and it's so good, and it runs, and you speak the word of God over your car. And they think you're crazy. If you went to them and said, why this piece of junk, et cetera, et cetera, they go, yeah, I can, yeah. They can, they'll get in agreement with you because they're flowing in the negative, the world's way of doing things. So darkness does not have the ability to suppress or to hold the light under its domain. I'll read that again. Darkness, that's verse 5. Darkness does not have the ability to suppress or to hold the light under its domain. Satan does not have the power to suppress healing light in your life. Satan, darkness, does not have the power to suppress prosperity in your life. He doesn't have that power. 
Well, Jesus said, I've taken away the keys of death, hell, and the grave. Then he said, all power has been given unto me in heaven and earth. Now you go. I'm seated with Christ in the heavenly places. He said, he's seated, and that's where my authority is. I'll read it again. Because people are blaming the devil for things, and he has no authority over light. Darkness or Satan does not have the ability to suppress or hold the light, your healing, your deliverance, your prosperity, under its domain. So it isn't Satan that can keep it from you. It's you that are stopping it. And so let's look at Mark 4:15. Mark 4, 15. Mark 4, 15. Not going to do a long teaching on that. That's, we saw the sower sows the word. This is a parable Jesus said. If you can understand this parable, you can understand them all. But anyway, the sower sows the word. It talks about the seed and it's a word. He sows the word. And in verse 15, it says, And Satan comes immediately to take away the word that was sown. Satan comes immediately to take the light that was sown. Satan comes immediately to take the healing word that was sown. Satan comes immediately to take the truth out of your life. So that he can now get you, if he can take the word out, you've got darkness in that area once again. He comes immediately. What's he trying to do? Change your inner image. He's trying to rearrange the dots. He doesn't want to see you to see who you truly are in Christ Jesus. He doesn't want you to see and know your identification with Christ. He's rearranging the dots. He's coming immediately to steal that light out. And the minute you remove light from a picture or change the light on a picture or on a photocopy, the copy you get is not going to be the original. And this is what he's trying to do. That's why he comes immediately. He doesn't really, bottom line, you know, once you're born again and if you just go sit in the corner in a bit, he doesn't care. There's one thing he is after, is the word. Because he knows once you've got the word, you understand faith, and you know your authority, he's done. And he doesn't want you running around loose in this earth. He doesn't need you running around loose. So he's out to steal the word. It says he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. What he is coming to steal, people say, oh, well, my, my uh, laptop was stolen. Well, that was Satan. He's not out to steal your laptop, darling. He's out to steal the word. He's out to steal the word. Once he steals the word, he can kill and destroy you. It's your fault your laptop was stolen. Probably. And if it wasn't, believe God for another one. Satan has no right. You caught the thief. He has to repay. Faith, the law of change. Faith comes by hearing the word. If he steals the word, you don't have faith, and you now cannot execute a change in your life. He comes to steal the word, which is why it's so imperative to spend time in the word, praying in other tongues, getting revelation of the word. We've never, ever exhausted a single scripture. I remember somebody had once come, and there was a person's, somebody in the ministry had fallen, and blah, 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 blah. And this person anyway had said, you could tell why they fell, because this, they were relatives. They said, I know why that person fell. You could see it. Thanksgiving, gratefulness, not in the word, not in worship. Because when you're not in the word, 
you're thinking about something opposite to the word that you want that the word says you shouldn't have. And if you're in the word, you wouldn't have time for it anyway. And deception comes in, and next thing you know, you're living a lie. Satan stole the word. You say, well, I'm not living a lie if, yes, if you don't, aren't operating in the word on it, it isn't truth. If it isn't Jesus, it isn't truth. Because truth came by Jesus. And if we make excuses, another thing I got, heard from Keith Moore, he says, if you take a scripture and twist it, that's a lie. And he says, a lie will destroy you. And he says, if you take that scripture, there's nothing to back it up. And now you've got to make a whole lot of stuff to try and back up what you're saying. And it's not going to work. Because now you're twisting the whole thing. So, Satan wants access. He wants to get the picture changed. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews 1. And remember, God does everything through his word. Everybody say, God does everything through his word. Do you know, as we said already this morning, God doesn't respond to our needs or what we do. We re he responds to what he's already done. And this is a side issue, but it's a good side issue. He does not respond to your praying if it isn't in line with the word. He responds to his word. And if you've got a problem... And you go to God, God, I got this problem, and I'm just no good, and I just can't do this, and everything's rotten, and everything's no good. He has compassion, but he can do nothing for you because you didn't give him anything to work with. There was no faith there. But you can go, God, this is a mess, and I know you've got your word that has the answer for me, and I now come to you, and you speak the word that he's already spoken pertaining to that situation. Health, whatever it is. You don't go to him saying, I'm so sick, I'm so sick. He's going, Jesus. This isn't really what he does, but I can just see this, you know. We're going, Father, I come to you in Jesus' name and I'm so sick and I'm so disgusted and I'm so broke and I'm just fed up with being fed up and do something. And he goes and he says, Jesus, come here. Jesus, come here. Let me see your back. Let me see your hands. Your feet. Wasn't it you that bore all that for them? Didn't you go down into hell for them? Didn't you take away the keys of death, hell, and the grave? Didn't you get all authority and didn't you give it back to them? Well, what's their problem? My people perish for a lack of knowledge. You see, God doesn't listen to that. He hears his word. It says he hearkens to the voice of his word. The angels hearken to the voice of his word. Satan's demons hearken to your voice in his words of defeat and despair. And his little demons go out and get busy on your behalf if you're speaking his words of doubt and despair. Faith is the law of change. Nothing else. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Why? Why does that mean? Because faith is Jesus' faith. He's the author of it. And faith pleases God because I am receiving what he's already done for me. And I am now, by faith, speaking it, showing I trust him. And he can effect a change because that pleases him. He didn't have Jesus go hang on the cross. He didn't have Jesus suffer. He didn't have him go into hell for three days and three nights. For him? 
He did it for us. He did it for us so we can be free. It was all for us. Every bit of it was for us. For us. Say every bit of Jesus' suffering was for me. He bore my penalty, my price. And because of him, I'm free. Hallelujah. So, um, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. How does he speak to us in these days? By his Son. By his son. And the Son is Jesus, right? And Jesus and the Word are one, so we can say he speaks to us by the word. Whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. In, in Romans 8, 17, it says, well, here it says, he is the appointed heir of all things. Romans 8, 17 says, we are joint heirs. Whatever he's given Jesus, he's given us. Everything he's given Jesus, he's given us. Everything he's given Jesus is in you. It's already in you. You don't have to ask him for it. It's in you. Three, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. If Jesus is the express image of his person and we're in him, that's the image we are to get on our heart. And upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of majesty on high. Now the reason I'm, this is in with faith is because the worlds were created by faith. And we now as a joint heir are to speak his words in this earth. To have the blessing manifest. Adam was supposed to, the Garden of Eden was just this little piece. And all the rest was a mess. Weeds, etc. At one time, I used to think the Garden of Eden covered the whole earth. It didn't. It was just this piece. And the blessing is to have, to be fruitful, multiply, replenish. So Adam was to replenish and make the rest of the earth the same as the Garden of Eden. And he was to do it by words and exercising his dominion and authority. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 28. We're to do the same thing. We're to copy and imitate Jesus. But we need faith. Because you release what's in here, and when you release it, it has to be released by faith. Because faith is the divine energy of God. Faith is the divine energy of God. Because it says, upholding all things by the word of his power. It doesn't say the power of his word. It says the word of his power. There's a difference. The word of his power. If you say the power of his word, you're really saying, well, there's more power out there beside his word. But when you say the word of his power, that encompasses all of it. Nothing more, nothing missing. It's all there. So everything that exists can be upheld, the blessing in your life can be upheld by the word of his power, which is why the divine energy of God is released by faith because it's in the word, the power, there's power in the word, and when by faith you release it, you're releasing the divine energy of God because faith releases the word of God and things change. It's a law. It's a law. So we now speak the word in the earth that upholds the blessing. 
Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Let's see. I want to finish this today. Um, we kind of looked before at Hebrews chapter 4, and we saw that, and here we see the works in operation again. God gave the promised land to the children of Israel. And he said, go on in and take it. Just take it. It was Ben's pen. And I just go in. I said, it's mine. I take it. But they came along and saw the land and said, yikes. There's giants there. It's my pen. God gave it to me. But I'm looking at Ben and I'm thinking, I don't know. He might have a gun in his pocket. <laughs> and that's more powerful than me. Isn't that what they did? They looked at the giants and saw themselves as grasshoppers. Satan distorted the image. He stole the word and distorted the image, and now they saw themselves as grasshoppers. Well, grasshoppers you kill. So they saw themselves as dead. So it talks this. They just wouldn't believe it. Everything that pertains unto life and godliness has been given to us. Do we believe it? Are we willing to go out and spend the time, get the word from our head to our heart, speak the word of power, exercise the law of faith, and have it? So they wouldn't go in, so they wouldn't receive the word, Let's go down verse 10. I think I want verse 10. For he that is entered into this rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into the rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. The land was given to the children of Israel. There were giants. God said, I've given it to you. They were to go in and take it. The battle isn't yours, it's the Lord's. We have been given God's armor. Satan comes as a roaring lion. Our job is to tear down strongholds, anything that's darkness, anything that doesn't line up with the word. Our job is to keep the word and not let Satan come and steal it. But we don't bring the word to pass. God watches over his word to perform it. I just keep it in my eyes, my ears, my mouth, and my heart. And then I speak. And you might say, well, I've spoken some things and they've not come to pass. Just keep meditating the word. Keep it in your eyes, your ears, your mouth. It'll get into your heart. Joshua, meditate in my word day and night that you may observe, which means see, to do. As we are in the word, in our eyes, our ears, our mouth, we will see to do. Seeing with our spiritual eyes. Because what we see is temporal in the natural, and it is subject to change to the eternal word of God. So we're to receive the word as seed. Verse 12, the word of God is quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of joints and marrows, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The word of God is quick, it's powerful, it's sharp, which means it's alive. It's alive. When you speak a word, in the Hebrew, it means you're speaking things into existence. The word, the root of the word word in the Hebrew is things. 
God said, light be. He spoke a thing. Trees, oceans, fish. They were words that he spoke, but the words that he spoke were things. When you speak words, you're speaking things, good or bad. When you speak words, you're to speak things. So when I speak healing, I see healing as a thing. When I speak to something, it has to change. I'm releasing the energy of God in that word, or I'm releasing Satan's death, darkness. So every word of God is filled with his love, because God is love. And your words, it says you and your words are one. And God's love never fails. So when I speak the word, I'm speaking things, and now I am putting dots in on my picture, and I am getting an image of my redemption of everything I've been redeemed from. We have to start speaking and realizing God sees us in Jesus. God sees us seated with Christ in heavenly places, Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1, it says, He hath past tense, not future tense, past tense. Past tense means back away. He hath already blessed us with all. Everybody say all. 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 All spiritual blessings. All spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Ephesians chapter 1. I'm not sure the verse, maybe 6, I don't know, maybe 3. Read the whole chapter, it's good. And that's how God sees us. That's the only way he sees us. And that's how we're to receive us. So the word will root out, that sharp sword will root out the wrong darkness things in our lives. It'll cut it. It'll make us realize that my soul realm, my feelings are involved here. And it will, that word will cut between my soul realm and the spirit. So it'll show me that I've been thinking wrong. I have thought this was okay, I thought this is the way it was, but when I get the word, the light on it, it cuts through that and reveals to me that was my soul realm and not my spirit. Because this is what it says, it divides it, it shows it, it separates, because a lot of people get their soul and their spirit mixed up. And if you start speaking the wrong thing, your spirit will lead you to the wrong place. I was listening to a Charles Cap the other day, and he said, when he was young, before he got the word and understood how words and speech, he said he had made a couple of bad decisions financially. And so he lost a lot of money, had to borrow money from his parents, and just lost it all, all this money. He said then, he got into this negative thing where now he went back to farming and, and he would go, well, you know what? If I plant it shallow, it'll freeze. If I plant it deep, it'll rain. He just spoke the wrong thing that he's going to do it wrong. Everything I do, I do wrong. I make the wrong decisions. He said, if I planted it one way, it was wrong. If I planted the other way. He says, people say, well, do you mean to say your confession brought the frost? Your confession brought the rain. He said, no. But I spoke that until I got it into my spirit. And my spirit man led me to do it the wrong way. Because that's what I had planted. But he says when he understood the law of confession and words, and he started speaking, I have the mind of Christ. The Holy Spirit leads me. I always plant my crops the right way. He never had a crop failure because his spirit man is now leading him to do the right thing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Galatians chapter 6 says you will sow what you reap. 
And it's talking about money there, but it also is their seed time and harvest. And whatever seed you plant, you're going to reap a harvest on those seeds. Hallelujah. Glory to God. One last scripture. I know it's, it's not late at all. Glory to God. Where else are we going to go on a beautiful day like today? Air conditioned. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance. Some say the title deed of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Words will become things. Faith is the parent source of everything in the world. In the world. Faith is the parent source. Well, you can see that in Genesis chapter 1. So these substance of things hoped for, you need to get an image in you of what you want so you can have hope. What are you hoping for? What are you hoping for? If you have no hope, you have nothing to put your faith to. Faith is substance. We said it's a divine energy of God in the word that's released by faith. But if you don't have any hope, Hope for, it could be anything, whatever dream or vision. You say, well, I don't have a dream, I don't have a vision, I don't have... Read the word, get it, get something. Get it from the word. It could be that you want to walk in divine health. So you get the scriptures on it, and you meditate nothing but the scriptures until hope arises. And you have such a big hope that I know I can have this. I'm hoping for this. God told me I could have it. And now you've got the word, and now faith, the law of change, will put substance to that, give it, bring it to back, put energy to it. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. But if you don't have anything you're hoping for, you have nothing for faith to give substance to. And too often we get so busy, we're just sort of floating around, and then something comes up and we think, oh yeah, I better, and we speak to it, and we pray over it, and we've got no hope that it's even going to come to pass. And everything's out of our head. And we give up on God. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. And we come to be partakers of the divine promises through knowledge, 2 Peter. Everything you want starts with words. This morning, whether you spoke or not that I'm going to church, the thought came. Words came, I'm going to church. Words came, I'm going to get out of the bed. Words came, I'm going to behave in an honorable way. Words came, I'm going to do this. Words came, I'm going to do that. Thoughts, words. You think, well, it's just a thought. If that thought doesn't line up with the word of God and you spend enough time thinking about it, it will become a stronghold. And you will end up doing things you shouldn't be doing, but you think they're okay. And then later somebody goes, but how could that happen to them? Thoughts, words brought it about. As that example I was talking about, that relative. Words, thoughts. What you're looking at, what you're thinking about. Paint pictures, images. Faith will give substance to it. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen are not made of things which do appear. God did not make the world out of nothing. It was by words, faith-filled words. And the reason... People say there is no God, or it was by evolution, an agnostic, whatever they are, is because they have no knowledge. Therefore, they don't have any faith. And it's only by faith. It says right here, I'll read it again. It's through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Only. And if people don't get the word of God, they will never believe the world was framed by the word of God. They don't have the knowledge of it. Anything we don't have knowledge on, we reject. 
So through faith, we understand that. So we are to frame our world by the words we speak. We're to give them voice. Romans said we're to renew our mind. And in James 1, 21 to 25, it says, and you can read that on your own, but receive with meekness, meaning don't think you don't know it, don't think you already know it, but receive the word with meekness, the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. And what does that mean? When you take a tree and you take it and graft something into it, it becomes part of it. Well, Jesus is the vine, we're the branches, right? So when we take the word, it will become engrafted. It'll graft into our spirit. It will be grafted into us, and then what's in that grafting in, that word will now become us. We will take the nutrients from that, and it'll become us. Receive the engrafted word. We have to receive it, not thinking we don't need it, not thinking we know more than God. We receive it. How do you receive? By reading it, by speaking it, by talking it, by hearing it. And it will become engrafted into you. It will be absolute part of you. The healing will be absolute part of you. It will absolutely be your sustenance in whatever area. Receive with meekness the engrafted word. Receive the word of God like Moses did. Just receive it. He was considered the meekest man. Receive the engrafted word, and it will save your soul. It will save your soul. When you speak opposite to the word, you're rearranging it. Glory to God. Just one other example if you take a Polaroid camera, and Ashlyn has this Polaroid camera, and she looks at you with it, and she snaps it, and just out comes this picture. So what happens? It's light sensitive. So what you're exposing the light to, you get it. So what we expose the, our spirit to, the light, that, that image is formed. Now, say you take that Polaroid, Polaroid camera, and I want to take a picture of this row here, all these people, and I turn off all the lights, and there's no flash. What am I going to get? Darkness, because it's not exposed to the light. Or I could take it and just hide it in these bushes here where it's dark, and I pull it out and think, why am I getting all these thorns and thistles? Why am I getting this mess? Instead of these beautiful picture, people on my picture, I've exposed it to darkness. And that's exactly what happens to our spirit man when we expose it to darkness. We get the wrong picture. Jesus said, my word, my word is truth. Expose it to Jesus. And don't be too proud to change something you've believed forever. If there's nothing you have to change in your believing from day to day or week to week or month to month, there's a problem. Because none of us know everything today. That's why the Holy Spirit's there, to continue to teach us, to teach us, to teach us. Sometimes think, did I say that? Did I believe that? Don't expose it to darkness. Don't expose yourself to darkness. Don't expose yourself to darkness. Don't believe the lies of the devil. And his lies usually come through people. Accusations from people. And generally, those accusations come when you're standing for light. It says you will be persecuted for righteousness' sake. When you stand for Jesus, righteousness, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, his way of doing and being right, Persecution will come. Jesus said it would. 
But don't receive the negative comments from whosoever that is speaking that because you're not in agreement with what they're doing. Because it doesn't line up to righteousness. God's way of doing and being right. And that's a continual thing. And you only stay sharp by being in the word and praying in other tongues. Praying in other tongues. Praying in other tongues. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Please stand.